The year is 1980. The music is synth pop, the hair is massive, bell bottoms have been swapped for neon leg warmers, and everything's turned an interesting shade of pink. The age is electric. And what better place to embrace this tidal wave than the arcades? Video games are gaining a firm foothold. The capabilities of new arcade hardware means that games are now more complex and crucially more eye-catching than they've ever been. Arcade manufacturer Namco got in early with this trend, and the previous year they'd struck it rich with Galaxian, a game that needs no introduction. At least, they thought they'd struck it rich, but they hadn't seen anything yet. The next game, first released in June 1980, would not only break new ground for video games, it would propel them into a household name, and prove to the world that these pixelated pastimes were the next big thing. This is Pac-Man, but you didn't need me to tell you that. He's one of the most recognisable faces in video gaming. The goal of Pac-Man is as straightforward as it gets. Navigate the maze and eat all the dots. Of course, it's not as easy as it sounds. The maze also contains four ghosts, whose only goal is to see Pac-Man's untimely demise. Their motivations aren't exactly clear, so draw what conclusions you will. Occasionally a piece of fruit will appear in the centre of the maze. It can be pretty risky going for it, but it'll also net you a whole boatload of points, a currency recognised by arcade aficionados everywhere. Repeat until you eventually run out of lives. It's not too far removed from games we've already seen. Both Space Invaders and Galaxium require the player to clear a screen before moving on to the next one. The difference is, Pac-Man doesn't involve shooting or killing things. In the far corners of each maze are special dots, known as power pellets, or power dots, or power capsules, or even energizers, depending on where you look, which make the ghost vulnerable to Pac-Man's mighty maw for a short period. But eating one still doesn't kill them. All this does is buy the player time. To take some wisdom from Super Mario 64, ghosts don't die. Completing a maze will move you on to the next one. It's the exact same layout for the entire game. But that doesn't mean there aren't new things to see. Every few levels you'll be shown a short cartoon show, complete with musical refrain. That's what the flyer says, the term cutscene hadn't been invented yet. Pac-Man wasn't the first game with cutscenes, but it was certainly a major success on that front. And yes, let's talk about that music. Namco were keen on filling the games with audio, as evidenced by Galaxian, and they took it one step further with Pac-Man. The music may only be short, but it's certainly memorable, and having two different songs in a game was a pretty novel concept at the time. In fact, the same goes for the game's soundscape in general. No other game has quite the same sound as Pac-Man. You just know that arcade operators made sure it was the loudest machine in the room. Hearing that familiar wacka wacka noise was a sure way to pull in prospective Pac-Man players off the street, whether it's in an actual arcade, or a pub, or even a chip aisle. Hello, this is Johnny Blanchard from Reinfused, here to talk about my first experience with Pac-Man. It was the late 80s, and, as usual, for a Friday, me and my mate walked into our local chip shop after school for a bag of chips. Whilst waiting in the queue, we looked to the corner where a bulky fruit machine usually stood with its 18s only sign, and instead we spied a curious machine. This machine was Pac-Man, a beat in a rather generic cabinet. The store owner had decided to swap out the unreliable and rage-inducing fruit machine for what was already an arcade classic. We went to investigate, losing our place in the queue and very quickly all of the chip money in what would become a fight for score one-upmanship. The game was very different to anything we'd played before, featuring clearer graphics and, now we were closer and could hear it, far better sound. It took us a few tries to work out what we were doing, the generic cabinet didn't feature the helpful instruction graphics, and we were far too impatient to watch the attract screen but we slowly worked out what we were doing, each turn costing us a whole 10 pence from the pound we each had. After we ran out of cash, the walk home might have been hungry, but it was also punctuated with our very best impressions of Wacka Wacka. 
After that first time, we visited the chip shop whenever we had some cash and played Pac-Man. That lone arcade machine with its catchy gameplay solidified my love for arcade games, which would only grow over the years. And it's no coincidence that I've always sought out a version of Pac-Man on every gaming device I've owned since. As you continue playing, the game progressively gets faster and more difficult. The ghost haunting sound effects become more and more intense, an idea borrowed from Space Invaders, and the effect of the power pellets wears off quicker and quicker each round. This, of course, only compels players to give it another try, because they got so far last time, and will probably do better this go around. Another factor of the game's appeal is its simplicity. Pac-Man doesn't ask much of the player, all you need to know is how to point in a direction. You could literally do it with one hand behind your back. So, while it technically has more controls than, say, Galaxian, the game actually feels a lot less complex and more approachable as a result. So, where did this revolution start? It turns out the origins of Pac-Man are quite inclusive in nature. The game's designer, Toru Iwatani, wanted a game that everyone could enjoy. He'd had enough of all the shooting and violence, the games whose single goal was to kill or be killed. He saw that there was potential for a non-violent, light-hearted experience that was still engaging and fun to play. Part of his reasoning was that arcades were pretty male-dominated at the time, and he wanted to make, quote, a comical game that women could enjoy. In fact, Iwatani's original ambition was to make pinball games. It was only after he'd been hired by Namco that he realised his employer wasn't actually a pinball manufacturer. That wasn't about to stop him though. His first game with the company was a little thing called GB, a game which seems to get mentioned an awful lot on this channel. There are a couple of stories behind the design of the character himself. In the book Programmers at Work, Iwatani claims that the idea came from having a pizza for lunch one day. He took out a slice, and there before him was the yellow dot gobbler himself. Design can come from some strange places, so there's not really much reason to doubt this story. He also explains that the design comes from the Coochie character, which means mouth in kanji. Much of Pac-Man's character is that his appetite is comparable to a black hole, so this is understandable. His illustrations from the same book show how this came about. This inspiration stretches to Pac-Man's name, which is derived from the Japanese onomatopoeia used for eating, that is, Paku Paku. Originally his name was Puckman. however before shipping it off to the west, Namco's US distributor Midway noticed that any kid with a permanent marker could modify that P to a different letter, thus changing the name to something a little less family friendly. It was quickly tweaked, and Pac-Man was born. But what about those ominous ever-present ghosts? Where do they come from? Back to Iwatani for this one, and during a recent interview with IGN, he explained that they don't necessarily represent unrestful spirits whose corporeal forms have shuffled off this mortal coil. In fact, they were always ghosts. They're mischievous spectres, much like the Japanese yokai. Speaking of those ghosts, one of Pac-Man's innovations as a game was the use of early artificial intelligence in the enemy's behaviour. At first glance, it may appear that they just mill about randomly until Pac-Man gets close enough for them to lay chase. Nothing could be further from the truth. Each ghost actually has a different method of attack. Blinky will chase Pac-Man directly, Pinky will attempt to cut him off, Inky works with Blinky to try and pincer Pac-Man, and Clyde… well, he tries. Without getting into the nuances of how each one works, there are plenty of videos on that. It's fascinating to see the inner workings in action. Some versions of the game allow you to see their calculated paths, where they're aiming for, and how they intend to get there. Learning the AI patterns and quirks of their behaviour, i.e. the fact that they never turn back on themselves except in specific situations, is just one way of improving your Pac-Man game. The cultural impact of Pac-Man was so great, that if your arcade didn't have Pac-Man, you are basically dead. This yellow pizza was the hottest thing since the Beatles, and he wasn't going to stop at conquering the arcades. In 1980, home gaming was really starting to find its feet, and having Pac-Man at home sounded like one heck of a proposition. Well, you know who got it first. Yep, our old friends Atari. The Atari 2600 conversion of Pac-Man, released in 1982, is an absolute classic in every sense of the word. In fact, much like Space Invaders, it was a real system seller. Have you played Pac-Man? It's the new video computer game everyone's talking about. And naturally, it's from Atari. Have you played Atari today? Too bad it was also absolute rubbish.
Sure, it gets the idea across, and could very well have been a reasonable Pac-Man game at a time when that was your only option. But it lacks the cohesive maze design of the arcade original, which is vitally important to the balance of the game. What we have instead is a series of repeating walls which don't flow together well at all. Also, notice the flickering ghosts. This was done to simulate invisibility, and through a dodgy RF lead it might have looked somewhat convincing. But anything even slightly higher quality than that, and you can clearly see that only one ghost is visible in each frame. Considering all that, plus the slow speed of the game, the sluggish controls, and the lack in animation, then there's really not a whole lot here to recommend. I know it's the 2600, but when you look at other games on the system, including one we'll come back to later, that's no excuse. My experience with Pac-Man is quite weird really, I mean I never grew up with the arcade machine, in fact I don't actually recall even seeing it in arcades for years later when they start reproducing them. Uh, my first uh, experience with the game was actually the Atari VCS version, you know the, the 2600 one. Uh, my uh, aunts and uncle, you know, and cousins, they had an Atari VCS in their back room and they used to go over there like a couple of times a year and they always had that game on there. We never had it ourselves for some reason or we rented it or something. But yeah, I used to play it on that and all these years later of everybody moaning, you know, how terrible the game was and stuff like that, it wasn't bad for me. I quite, I quite enjoyed it because that, that was Pac-Man to me. So uh, the arcade version was completely different. I don't think I actually played a proper arcade version of Pac-Man until Namco Museum came out on the PS1, which is quite weird. But yes, no, so all my memories are playing the Atari VCS version. And like I said, if you've got no frame of reference of something being better than the original, that one was perfectly good and I was, I was happy playing it. So that is mostly my experience with Pac-Man. Obviously I played sort of the knockoffs and stuff like that, like somebody make a public domain version for the Amiga and stuff like that. Fast food on the Amstrad with Dizzy. Remember playing that. So I always played derivatives of Pac-Man until I finally played the original version years later. So that is my experience with Pac-Man. Fortunately, some of the parts were a little more accurate, such as the Atari 8-bit conversion. It's a nice little Pac-Man game, with a proper maze and all ghosts present and accounted for. Or standings at least, judging by the colours. One thing you might not notice straight away, is that this version seems to lack the AI of the original. So it's kind of easy. Nevertheless, this was itself quite a popular game, and was the version used for this competition in Milwaukee back in the day. This particular Saturday is the day Craig's been waiting for, the world's largest Pac-Man tournament. It's called the world's largest Pac-Man tournament because it's being played on the nation's largest electronic screen, the 30 by 60 foot scoreboard at Milwaukee County Stadium. The size of this board makes the Pac-Man gobbler two and a half feet tall. I could keep going all day with these Pac-Man ports. It was such a smash hit that they just never stopped coming. Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, Intellivision, IBM PC, and that's just the official ones. There have been so many unofficial Pac-Man conversions that I wouldn't hesitate to put the number in the thousands. As the angry video game nerd put it, if you've played Pac-Man, you've played Taxman without even knowing it. Replace Taxman with, say, PC-Man, CD-Man, Pac-Em, Gob-Man, Cruncher, or Hungry Horace, and you can see just how flooded the market was. Everyone wanted a slice of that pie. The simplicity of Pac-Man means there aren't a ton of mechanics to get right, so a lot of them play decently well. Others are absolute train wrecks, because I guess you can't win them all. Following the blinding, unexpected runaway success of our yellow spherical friend, Midway saw an opportunity. Where you two see problems, I see opportunity. You see, a small arcade manufacturer called General Computer Corporation were peddling conversion kits of popular games, usually to enhance them with extra gameplay features or increased difficulty. This wasn't an unheard of practice, but it was a little risky. Following the success of their super missile attack kit, they'd already faced legal action from Atari, who thankfully decided to contract them instead. Their most recent product was Crazy Otto, an enhancement board for Pac-Man. What you're seeing here is a recreation based on videos and presentations. Its main innovation was that it added new mazes, but other changes include fruit that moved around the maze and less predictable behaviours for the ghosts. 
It also expanded on Pac-Man's cutscenes with new musical numbers and... Well, I guess we need to talk about this freak. Crazy Otto himself is based on the cabinet artwork for Pac-Man's US release. Attempts were made, let's just say. Towards the end of development, GCC contacted Midway to see if they'd be interested in manufacturing it themselves. They had in mind something like Super Pac-Man, which would be sold as an add-on board to the original game. Hey, you may have heard that we trounced and pounded Atari in court and they dropped their lawsuit. <laughs> We're about to do the same thing to you. Um, so here's, we had, by then we'd written a new attract mode, and we didn't know, is it going to be Crazy Auto? Is it going to be Super Pac-Man? So we had both by then, and we had come up with this cool Midway logo, because they're giving us money, we're going to be nice to them. And then Stan calls, and I took this phone call. This is early November. We want to make the female character the main character of the game. We're going to call it Miss Pac-Man, M-I-S-S, -S, Miss Pac-Man. It's going to be cool. A little back and forth later, with Namco's involvement on the design of the character, and in February 1982, Pac-Man had its very own sequel. Say hello to Miss Pac-Man. <laughs> Miss Pac-Man really does feel like an improvement over the previous game. For starters, there are four different mazes to be found this time, which already shakes things up a bit. Not only that, but as I mentioned earlier, the ghost AI has been improved a little bit. Let me explain. In the original, each ghost has a preferred corner that they'll occasionally go to as part of their routine. Miss Pac-Man has that as well, but the preference is randomised each time. Tweaks were made to the behaviours in general on top of this, to make the game overall less predictable than its predecessor. You can't forget that bouncing fruit as well. Having the fruit move around the maze introduces another layer of challenge to the game, and it takes a skillful player to master all these little nuances. Pretzels, huh? Miss Pac-Man, you better watch what you eat. A moment on the lips is a lifetime on the hips. But the main change, of course, is our main character. Miss Pac-Man herself is, well, very traditionally ladylike, shall we say. Otherwise, she's basically the same as Pac-Man. Indeed, the first cutscene shows her meeting her featureless male counterpart, in which they bond over their shared status as quarry for wandering ghosts. In fact, the whole game has this sort of dramatisation thing to it. Each cutscene is preceded by a clapperboard, showing which act we're currently witnessing. Not only that, but Miss Pac-Man's death animation has been changed quite a bit. Rather than the iconic, surreal death exhibited in the original, Miss Pac-Man dramatically swoons and faints. Yes, it even says that on the flyer. In fact, let's take a look at that flyer. She looks like a 60s Hollywood starlet at a red carpet premiere. Even the attract screen shows her name in flashing lights. Well, sort of. Her name was a bit of a controversial point, actually, during development. As you've just heard, Midway originally slated her as M-I-S-S Pac-Man. This choice was all well and good, until it was revealed that, in the third cutscene, she and Pac-Man have a baby together. Now remember, this is the 80s, and depicting a character having a baby out of wedlock, even if that character is effectively a yellow ball with a gob, was a little on the risky side. Other names, such as Mrs. Pac-Man and Pac-Woman, were banded around, but these were considered a little cumbersome. Eventually, the final name of Ms. Pac-Man was landed upon. And I know I've been pronouncing it Miss all this time, but that's the only way I've heard it pronounced. So there. Perhaps the most important takeaway here is that Miss Pac-Man showed the world that female leads in games were nothing to be scared of, a fact that some people today still have trouble with. Not only that, but it almost validated the place of women and girls in the arcades. No longer did they have to be male-dominated places, and indeed, a 1982 report by Electronic Games magazine suggested that women were largely responsible for Pac-Man's success. Namco recognised this, and that's why we ended up with Miss Pac-Man in the first place. There's even another female ghost called Sue, because why not? I really should make brief mention of a couple of Miss Pac-Man's ports. Remember the original port of Pac-Man on the Atari 2600? Well, take a look at Miss Pac-Man. It's a massive improvement in every possible way, and makes me wonder why the first game couldn't have been this good. You have all the elements of the arcade version, the bouncing fruit, the new mazes, an alt lot. And the ghosts don't flicker, unless you're really close to them. It's a very nice version. I suppose it's only telling that the developer of this game was, indeed, General Computer Corporation itself. 
There were a few other ports of this game, including a version for the Super Famicom. Pretty nuts that it was still getting ported over 14 years after its release. This version is based on an unlicensed NES port by Tengen, and includes a few new features. To start with there's this pack booster, which makes Miss Pac-Man move super fast, meaning you can whip through mazes in no time. Speaking of which, there are a whole bunch more mazes in this game. You can pick from four distinct categories, arcade, mini, big, and strange. The mini and big stages are just derived from the originals. Come on guys, I'm sure you could have made it fit on one screen. The strange stages are, well, I don't know what's so strange about them. They're mostly corridors. Is strange synonymous with poorly designed or something? You know, the more I play this, the more it looks like some shareware DOS game. It's really got that aesthetic to it, don't you think? Overkill. Right, before we go any further, I must mention that I usually try and cover as many games as possible in these retrospectives. But with Pac-Man, there are just too damn many to fit in one video. That's what happens when you have one of the world's most successful games, I suppose. So, excuse me if I miss some of your favourites. Namco really wanted to ride the Pac-Man boom, and turned out several more games within the following two years. First was Pac-Man Plus, a midway conversion kit which essentially makes the game harder, through various tweaks. It was mainly to keep the Pac-Man craze going in the arcades, while Namco worked on a proper sequel to the game. Super Pac-Man was that sequel, and it makes some drastic changes to the gameplay. The maze is smaller and a bit more crowded as a result, and instead of dots, you're eating nothing but fruit. He must be on a diet. On top of that, half the maze is locked off, and you have to eat keys to open it up. This introduces a little strategy, since you don't want to block yourself in. You still have ghosts and power pellets, but you also have these super dots, which make Pac-Man grow massively in size. Is this supposed to be spinach? I'm not sure if this is meant to represent him flying or just getting stronger, but whatever the case, he can smash through locked doors and, uh, sail past the now flattened ghosts as if they're nothing. There are also bonus stages in and amongst, and he's on donuts and burgers now. So much for that diet. Junior Pac-Man. This game is essentially Miss Pac-Man but wider. That's a heck of a rite of passage. Send him straight into the maze. He's got to learn someday. There's not a whole lot more to say about this one, but it represents a point where Midway were pushing the luck a little too far with the Pac-Man license. While Namco did have a hand in Miss Pac-Man's development, they didn't authorise Plus or Junior at all. It was around this time that the Pac game started to branch out a little. We already know about Baby Pac-Man, the rather underwhelming pinball video game hybrid from Bally, but we also have Professor Pac-Man, released to arcades in 1983. Essentially, it's a quick-fire quiz game based on observation. Pick the correct mirror image, complete this shape, pick the odd one out, and so on and so forth. I can't imagine going to the arcade and playing this. Arcades are supposed to be fun, this is like homework. Professor Pac-Man was the last straw for Namco, who consequently broke off their agreement with Midway. And I'm not surprised, it's like a bad DOS edutainment game. Fortunately for the pack, his Japanese creators had been cooking up a new game which would also first grace the arcades in 1983, it was Pac and Pal, another variation on the classic maze formula. In this game, Pac-Man is joined by a new character, Miru, a rogue ghost and traitor to the cause. But she's helping us, so it's all good. It's pretty similar to how Super Pac-Man works, but instead of collecting keys to open doors, this task is now delegated to these playing cards scattered around the level. Flip one over, and whatever's on the other side is what gets unlocked. The goal, as ever, is to eat everything on the stage. We've now dispensed with dots of all kinds. Instead of power pellets, the power-ups are now characters from Namco's other games. For example, on the first stage you can eat a Galaxian, which allows Pac-Man to fire a tractor beam... from Gallagher. Unfortunately, this doesn't convert other ghosts and give you double firepower. It just stuns them for a few seconds. Similarly, the Rally X car allows you to breathe exhaust fumes, which stun the ghost for a few seconds. I don't know, I feel like they were running out of ideas at this point. Anyway, Miru's job is to run around and help collect fruit, which she brings back to the centre of the maze. This may seem useful, but any items she collects aren't worth any points, so it's best to eat as much fruit as possible. She'll also pinch the power-ups, and once they're gone, they're gone. Cheers, Miru. Some pal you are. For some reason, when the game came to North America, Miru was replaced with a round dog called Chomp Chomp. You cannot pet the dog, that is all. 
Namco's new poster boy was going from strength to strength. He conquered the arcades, he had merchandise and records about him, and he was about to go where no other video game character had gone before. In 1982, veteran animation studio Hanna-Barbera saw fit to produce a cartoon based on Pac-Man in what would be the first ever cartoon based on a game. This was kind of a big deal for video games and their validity as a medium. At this point, they weren't just some yuppie fad. If they were getting the attention of more traditional forms of entertainment, then by golly they must be worth something. The cartoon is pretty standard family fun. It's nowhere near the quality of a certain cat and mouse, or a certain man and dog in a car, or a certain group of meddling kids, you get the picture. But it paved the way for video games to be more accepted, even embraced as a valid form of entertainment. And there have been countless game-based cartoons and TV shows ever since. But hang on, are we talking about the history of cartoons here, or Pac-Man? Following the cartoon's original tenure, 1984's Pac-Land may look a bit of a relic, but it too broke new ground. Because unbelievably side-scrolling platformers were a novel thing in 1984. It wasn't the first by any stretch, but it went on to influence such games as Ghosts and Goblins, Wonder Boy and... Oh, what's that game with the dude in the red hat? That'll come to me. Speaking of red hats, here's Pac-Land. Gameplay-wise, it's a nice little platforming romp, isn't it? The goal is generally to run from left to right, avoiding obstacles such as ghosts in cars and ghosts in buses and ghosts in planes who drop smaller ghosts. Power pellets make a triumphant return, allowing Pac-Man to devour ghosts whole as in the first game. But sometimes you'll chow down on one, only to find nobody's about. Occasionally you'll come across these springboards, which usually means there's a huge gap coming up. It took me a while to work out what I was supposed to do with it, but your mileage will very likely vary. For me, this game harkens back to the likes of Pitfall, but the scrolling and increased emphasis on verticality really is a step forward. The controls haven't aged terribly well and feel quite floaty, even compared to Super Mario Bros. As an example, sprinting is done by double tapping the joystick in a particular direction. It's a bit awkward, especially when you have to do it on the spur of the moment. More often than not, the pack just rams headfirst into a ghost car. Overall, not a bad game and for the time it must have been quite mind-blowing seeing something like this in the arcades, much like the original. It does, however, mark the beginning of Pac-Man's insidious spread into genres outside of his wheelhouse. Let's just quickly take stock. Within this period, there were three Space Invaders games, counting the original. There were also four Galaxian games. And there have been ten Pac-Man games. If that doesn't speak to the series' success, I don't know what does. Pac-Man may have demonstrated a diversion from the classic Pac-Man gameplay, but the nation's favourite spherical mouth creature wasn't quite done with the main genre just yet. 1987 saw the release of a game which took advantage of the relatively new Namco System 1 arcade board. I could get into the rabbit hole of what this hardware was all about, but I'll let the game speak for itself. Welcome to Pac-Mania. <laughs> It's an isometric game of Pac-Man! Well, not quite isometric, but you get what I mean. It's a pretty cool way to demonstrate what the arcades could do. But that's the thing, it feels a bit more of a tech showcase than a decent game in its own right. Let's discuss why. But first, it's really dark, isn't it? Hang on. Ah, that's better. Original cabinets don't have this issue, so it may be an emulation bug. This will be important later on, trust me. Essentially, the game is Pac-Man. You navigate a maze, eat the dots, consume power pellets, and digest the ever-present ghosties. So far, so standard. In addition to Blinky, Pinky, Inky and Clyde, we have the return of Sue, who's now purple to differentiate it from Clyde, and two brand new ghosts, Funky and Spunky. These two make use of the exciting new ability afforded to Pac-Man, that being, he can jump! That Pac-Man business obviously rubbed off on him. The jumping is absolutely necessary in order to survive, because, as you may have noticed, you don't have visibility on the whole maze at any one time. This happened with pinball games at the time as well, funnily enough. 
This, of course, means you can't easily plan ahead and look at where the ghosts are going to be. So being able to dodge them entirely is pretty darn helpful. It does have its limits, though. You can't just bounce around willy-nilly. This isn't Commander Keen, you know. I enjoy the aesthetic of the characters in this game. The ghosts are fantastic, and the way they peer up at Pac-Man's uh, bottom as he jumps is a nice touch. Pac-Man himself is very well animated too. I am not so sure about the mazes though. While the first level is made from Lego and therefore exempt from any criticism, all the others are a bit spartan in design. Perhaps this was to make the gameplay a bit clearer, but I feel like they could have done a better job. If the second level of your arcade game is predominantly grey, perhaps you better have a rethink. The music makes up for it though. Pac-Mania is a cool little reimagining of the original. Possibly they could have done a bit more with the format and made a lot more changes, but I don't think they really needed to. It works, it's fun, the additions make it feel fresh, and there's plenty here to enjoy. It is the 90s, and there is time for Pac-Man. He is a changed Pac-Man. From his humble beginnings, he's had a taste of success, and he wants more. And so, the 90s saw his games take a sharp diversion from the maze games his fans were used to. He branched out, and what he brought back was... <coughs> variable in quality, shall we say. The first one is Pack Attack, a puzzle game released in 1993 for the SNES and the Mega Drive. This is what happens when Pac-Man sees Tetris and thinks he needs a piece of that action. And to be fair, it's an enjoyable variation on that theme. As in Tetris, forming lines with blocks will clear that line and earn you some points. But you may notice you're also dropping infinite clones of Blinky, and occasionally a Pac-Man. The trick here is to line up the ghosts in such a way that Pac-Man can chew through them without leaving any behind. It's a great way of keeping you on your toes, and makes for an exciting and energetic bit of gaming. One that I wasn't very good at, but still. The following year, Namco graced Japanese home consoles with the strangely named Hello Pac-Man. When this was shipped out west, it got a new title. Pac-Man 2? So this is kind of a follow-up to Pac-Land, but instead of being a Levels and Ladders style platformer, it's... uh, Well, let's go from the top. I don't know where they got the idea that Pac-Man is cool. Is he cool? I don't think he's cool. I think he's a goof. In this game, you have to guide a hapless Pac-Man as he goes about his daily chores. Because that's fun. His first mission, should he choose to accept it, is... Go and get some milk. I'm not making this up. Now you'd think that'd be a pretty straightforward task, right? Not for Pac-Man. He may be a heroic, dot gobbling ghost dodging video game star, but his domestic abilities leave a lot to be desired. For example, immediately after leaving the house, he walks in totally the opposite direction to where you get milk in this town. Not that you, the player, would know that straight away. Your only method of control is a slingshot, which can be used to influence events in Pac-Man's two-dimensional reality. You can shoot apples off trees, you can shoot at dogs to anger them, you can shoot a rake out of a farmer's hand. No! Oh boy, you're going to feel that in the morning. What? That kills you? Pac-Man, you wimp. In fact, there's an awful lot that kills you. Stung by bees, you die. Beaten up by a cat, you die. Crash into a door, you die. Trip over a rock, you die, you die, you die, you die. The dude is a total buffoon in this game. He doesn't seem to remember what he's out to do and he absolutely won't go and get that milk autonomously. He only knows how to function when he's in a maze. So the milk can be acquired on the farm to the right of the house. But you don't just go and get some milk, no sir. The pack has to milk the cow himself. What kind of operation are they running here? Of course he can't reach the bottle, and he's not smart enough to jump up and get it. You can shoot it, but it'll only smash and then it'll be like, well, that's that, now I can do now. What you're supposed to do is shoot the bird who will swoop down, knock the bottle off and then Pac-Man will pick it up and then he'll get to milking. Yeah, look, he's so proud of himself. And yet, as soon as he gets home, he walks straight past his own darn house. <laughs> I actually quite enjoy the concept here. And you know, I feel like it'd be really well suited to an edutainment game. Pac-Man 2 ends up being a lot frustrating though. It's fun to work out the puzzles and it can be a nice challenge. But sometimes you know how the puzzle's gonna go. You just don't know how to communicate that to our sentient spherical superhero. Packing Time is a platformer released for a whole heap of systems. You're currently looking at the DOS version. In this game, Pac-Man gets thrown back in time, hence the title, by a so-called ghost witch. 
and has to confront his dangerous past. Translation error or supervillain origin story. Either way, he also apparently gets turned into a pack boy because time travel has no rules. This deep, exciting lore is bequeathed unto us, the player, by medium of extremely slow text crawls. A riveting experience. There's that word again, cool. What's cool? This? The game itself is a straightforward platformer. You can bounce around like a ball, which I suppose makes sense given the character we're playing as. Perhaps it's a holdover from Pac-Mania. Also, apparently he had the ability to chuck her Dawkins around as a young Pac, and swing around like he's found himself a ninja rope. The control is super slippery and the graphics are a little muddy, but it's a decent enough game overall. But you may be looking at this and thinking it's familiar, especially you Amiga fans out there. Well, let me show you why. Yep, it's a reskin of an earlier game called Fury of the Furries, released on the Amiga. Apparently Namco wanted to use it to break into the European market. So they asked, politely I hope, if Pac-Man could be the star of this adventure for DOS, Mac OS and Game Boy. For the SNES release, they created new levels and graphics, while still keeping the core gameplay intact. I'd say this is the version to play. 1995. Pac-Man turns 15. There were no fancy schmancy celebrations back then. Games didn't really seem to have anniversaries until the mid noughties I expect the release of Namco Museum was timed such that it coincided with the occasion though. We don't need to dwell on this too much. We already know the museum's shtick from Gallagher. Pac-Man takes centre stage of course as an omnipresent indicator on the bottom right of the screen. He also takes top billing amongst the included games, which is to be expected. Man, Pac-Man's house is really weird, isn't it? Now, this conversion may look a little different to its arcade counterpart, and your immediate thought may be along these lines. Hey, it's been 15 years. Surely, surely it should be pixel perfect. Well, the original arcade version, with its vertical monitor, stood at 288 pixels tall. That's somewhat more than the 240 lines output by the PlayStation. So it's good they went to the effort of making it fit within the screen space, without resorting to ugly downscaling. I thought there wouldn't be a whole lot to say about this one, but I actually tried using this version for practice, and I noticed something a little off. See if you can spot it. While the ghosts still move in a predictable manner, they don't act exactly as they do in the arcade, meaning the tried and true patterns for getting through each maze are worth nothing here. I found that a bit odd, but I expect they didn't have the hardcore audience in mind when putting this collection together. It still functions as a Pac-Man game after all, and the vast majority of players wouldn't notice the difference. The Namco Museum series was preceded by an arcade compilation called Namco Classic Collection. It included a selection of titles from Namco's history, as well as special arranged versions of said games. But what's this? Pac-Man isn't included? Nope, he didn't show up until the following year, and volume 2 of the collection. I'm surprised, you'd have thought he'd get first dibs. Perhaps they just wanted a little more polish for this one, and needed a big hitter to include with the two other games that, let's face it, aren't exactly system sellers on their own. The first thing that hits you is the art style. It looks amazing. It takes what Pac-Mania did well and improves it even further, giving us a vibrant game of Pac-Man filled with personality. The Pac himself is bouncy and squashy, the ghosts are well animated without being overdone, and the environments are just fun to look at. One thing I will say is that the rippling dots can make the playfield look a bit too busy, but that's about my only complaint. The ghosts seem a lot less predictable this time around. While they still have the preferred corners, their movements feel a lot more aggressive and dogged. There's also a fifth ghost chucked into the mix called Kinky. No, no, we're not making that joke here. Kinky can't attack Pac-Man directly since they're always blue, and eating them will scare the other ghosts off too, allowing you to rack up a whopping 3200 points for gobbling them all. You may be wondering what the point is then. Well, if Kinky gets close to another ghost, they'll upgrade that ghost into a double-height Pac-Man killing machine. Each one gets a unique ability, 
Blinky grows horns and starts charging around the place. Pinky turns into a bunny for some reason and can leap across the maze. Inky projects a holographic mirror image of himself which is just as deadly, a trick the UNSC could do with. And Clyde places more dots, keeping the level going for longer. In later levels you can actually have multiple Kinkies roaming around and causing trouble. Hey, get enough of them and they could form a rock band. You're not completely helpless against these new developments however. The game will chuck the odd helping hand your way to even the odds. Power pellets make a return as you'd expect. As well as these you get a dash power up which propels Pac-Man forward at such a velocity that it'll knock out any ghost in his path. Time it right and you can even skid round corners and keep your momentum going a little longer. These are all single use only because they wouldn't want to make it too easy. And before I forget there's a simultaneous two player mode. I admit that I didn't expect much from this arranged version of Pac-Man. After all, Galaga Arranged was basically the original game with a fresh coat of paint, and that seems to apply to the other arranged games too. But this game adds some really nice features to the mix, while still maintaining that balanced gameplay and difficulty curve. I did find it a lot harder than the original game, but the rule of fun is law, and this one follows that rule to the letter. The arrival of the PlayStation, followed by the Nintendo 64, marked a dramatic change in the home gaming landscape. We'd seen 3D-ish visuals in the arcades going back to the early 80s, but having full 3D games on your own TV was a radical experience. Everything had to be 3D in the 90s. Naturally, this gave rise to the 3D platformer. To summarise, without going too deep into the rabbit hole, 3D platformers saw a huge explosion between 1995 and 99, and kind of fizzled out beyond the year 2000. Most of what came along after that were sequels, and the few original IPs didn't see the popularity they would have done in that initial period. Whatever the case, this was a new trend in gaming. And of course, Pac-Man just had to get involved. He wasn't going to let something new and exciting just pass him by. So, throwing their lot in with the 3D platforming craze, Namco chucked out their own take on the formula, Pac-Man World. It opens with an awkwardly animated cutscene, and can I immediately ask, if Namco can produce CGI cutscenes on the level of that scene in Tekken 2, why does this one look so dodgy? Anyway, the crux of the matter is Pac-Man's entire family gets kidnapped, and Puka from Dig Dug is here as well for some reason. Turns out these are the evil machinations of some gadget calling himself Tokman, and I find myself not really caring all that much. It has basically no relevance to the actual gameplay. Speaking of the actual gameplay, well, it's a 3D platformer. Pac-Man can run around in all the directions, and he can jump. So far, so average. You soon learn the magic of butt bouncing to reach higher areas. Yes, that's actually what it's called. Because Pac-Man don't need no double jumps. It feels like a natural extension to what he was doing in Pac-Mania. But you know what else it feels like? Commander Keen's pogo stick. Anyway, there are a few other tricks in the Pac's moveset. He also has this thing called a rev roll, because calling it a dash bin would have been too on the nose. It's not long until you come to a section with an underwater chest, and it looks like Pac-Man doesn't need to press any stupid green switches to turn into metal. Pac-Man World doesn't wear its inspirations on its sleeve so much as it copies its inspiration homework while changing a few of the words. Controls wise it works fine, but it really could use analogue support. There is some range of movement if you use the sticks but Pac-Man is locked to moving in only 8 directions, which can make some of these platforming sections a little tricky. These are pretty few and far between though. For the most part it plays like a traditional 2D game, so it kinda gets away with it. I enjoy that it's got a decent range of level styles, especially given that you can access quite a few of them from the very beginning. So you can either blast through the game area by area, or mix it up depending on how you're feeling. Like I said before, there's no real cohesion here. You've got a beach and a space station about a stone's throw from each other. But the same could be argued for other platformers, so it gets a pass. And I have to give it a huge heap of credit for having a Galaxian as a boss. Along the way, you can unlock these maze levels, which function much like a classic game of Pac-Man. Not a whole lot to report here, but it's nice to see some extra features for diligent players. There's also a classic mode, which will become a mainstay in Pac games from this point onwards. Understandable, since the hardware is now powerful enough, and the disk space plentiful enough, that developers can just chuck arcade accurate games in willy nilly. Kinda funny that it's the same version as on Namco Museum, but I suppose why waste all that effort? 
The problem I have with this game is that it's a little too basic. And you may be thinking, well, it's all well and good saying an old game is basic. And to that I respond that I would cut it some slack, if it was released in 96. Lots of developers were trying their hands at 3D platformers during that year, so I would have forgiven some of its misgivings, the dodgy animations, the dodgy frame rate, and the dodgy controls, for being a product of its time. But this game was released in 1999, the same year we got Spyro 2. And don't forget, we'd also had Crash Bandicoot Warped the previous year. With that in mind, I feel like there was a lot of untapped potential with Pac-Man World. However, it must have resonated with someone because there was a sequel. In fact, there were two. Pac-Man World 2, on the PlayStation 2, makes some improvements over the original formula. Not only does it look a lot better, with improved animations and textures, but the controls are also quite a bit smoother, and they make slightly better use of the 3D space. They really drop the ball on the camera though. It's horrendous. Every time you move, the camera flies around in such a way that makes it a real struggle to control. It might not look so bad from just watching it, and it's one of those things that you really have to experience firsthand to truly get a feel for how frustrating it is. Unfortunately, the level design really goes downhill later on in this game. It's more linear as well, not allowing you to sample all the different areas at your leisure. And then there's this nonsense. It's like they said, oh you want verticality? We'll give you verticality. The extra maze levels return, and there's also an arcade full of classic games which can be unlocked by finding coins within the main game. But what's this? It's the same inaccurate Pac-Man again. There's really no excuse anymore, we've got 480 lines to play with this time. These games wouldn't be Pac-Man's final foray into the world of 3D platforming, but we have a few intervening years to deal with first. Up to this point, Pac-Man's career has been pretty darn varied, hasn't it? We've had maze games, edutainment games, platform games, puzzle games, adventure games. It seems like there's no genre that's been untouched by the pack. And the sheer number of games we've seen in these 20 years has been staggering. For a video game character to explode in such a way was totally unheard of. By the time Pac-Man World was released, you couldn't move for Pac-Man merchandise. But of course, there are 20 more years to cover yet, and we just don't have time for that in this video. So, join me for part 2, where we'll take a trip beyond the year 2000, and see just how Pac-Man was treated by the 21st century. See you for the next one.